Hi, welcome back to the fourth installment of the Rules of the Road review from Chesapeake Marine Training. In this last installment, we're going to focus on the sound signals that we haven't covered yet. And we're going to focus on the annexes and a few little lights that we may see at the very back of those and kind of sum up this last section of the book that we haven't discussed yet. So the first page that we're going to start on is page 96 and 97. And that is going to start with part D, the sound and light signals. Now, rule 32 <clears throat> has some definitions in there. And it would be kind of nice if you got one of these definitions as a test question because it's on the fairly easy side. But um, A says a word whistle means any sound signaling appliance capable of producing the prescri prescribed blast complying with Annex 3. Annex 3 covers how many decibels the whistle signal needs to be and kind of um, gives you the distance that you might need to hear that whistle. So I mean, some are right around two nautical miles for most vessels. So um, you should just realize B and C is probably more where the test questions would come from and also defining them helps us with the next section. So a short blast is about one second. So if we're listening to a ship's whistle, it might be ah, whereas a prolonged blast might be four to six seconds. Uh, that might be a prolonged blast. All right, so now rule 33. Rule 33 states equipment for sound signals. A vessel of 12 meters or more in length shall be provided with a whistle. So I've annotated that here. So short blast, one second. Prolonged blast, four to six seconds. What equipment is required on each vessel? If you're 12 meters or more in length, you have to have a whistle on board. If you are 20 meters or more, you're going to have a whistle and you're going to add in a bell. If you are 100 meters or more, you're going to have a whistle, you're going to have a bell forward, and you're going to have a gong. So the larger the vessel, the more sound signal appliances that we need to have so that we can make other vessels aware of maybe a maneuver that we're doing or whether we are anchored or aground or um, just that we're really large. It kind of indicates size when we're talking about a gong. We know that a gong is only on vessels over 100 meters. So uh, the basics, whistle, 12 meters or more, whistle bell, 20 meters or more, Whistle bell gong, 100 meters or more. And then for anyone that's less than 12 meters, they describe some other efficient sound, which I've taken that to mean sometimes maybe like an air horn or something that you could buy at West Marine or Walmart, uh, just to make sure that other vessels know that you are there, but you're not equipped with like a ship's whistle. Now on page 98 and 99, we're going to get into the maneuvering and warning signals in rule 34. Now, Rule 34 has some significant differences between the international side and the inland side. So we have to make sure that we understand those differences. And that's where a lot of people have problems when it comes to rules of the road is that they can't differentiate between what's happening on the inland waters, which is inside of the demarcation line, and what's happening on the international waters, which is the seaward side of the demarcation line. So I'm going to kind of take those uh, step by step. So the first section, the top half of this book, is generally talking about meeting and crossing. Now, they only say that on the inland side, but uh, that's kind of what they're inferring on the international side, meaning that you're going to do a maneuver to uh, either get out of the way of someone or to change your course, and this is how you're going to indicate that. So first, I'm going to focus on the international side, which is going to be uh, listed right here uh, on the board. And so it says, when vessels are in sight of one another, a power-driven vessel underway, when maneuvering, authorized by the rules or required, shall indicate that maneuver with the following signal on her whistle. So that's a test question in itself. For international waters, where or when do you do a whistle signal for maneuvering? Well, you must be on a power-driven vessel, and you must be in sight of another vessel, meaning if you're a fishing vessel or a sailing vessel or restricted or not under um, command or CBD, any of those, this, this doesn't apply to you. 
This is just a basic power driven vessel that has nothing else special going on. And by the way, I need to be in sight of another vessel. So I have to be able to observe them visually. Remember that goes back to rule three. So when I am out there and maybe in a meeting or crossing type situation, or I'm going to maneuver for international waters only, that signal is a signal of action. And when I say action, I am, I am. That means I'm not asking you for permission. I'm going to do it. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that you can't respond with five short, which is the doubt or danger, old danger signal. They now call it the doubt signal. Uh, five short and rapid blast should always mean, Hey, you know, someone's uncomfortable with what we're doing. So, um, when we talk about maneuvering for international, it's going to be one short, two short, or three short. All right. Now, I am is action. I'm not waiting for a response. You're not even going to give a response. They're just kind of giving you the courtesy to tell you what they're going to do. So when I think about international and inland, but specifically for this one, because it's action, I think about a clock. And if you look at a clock, you'll see 12 o'clock straight up the middle, right? And if you look to the right of 12 o'clock, you'll see the number one. And so when I think about these maneuvering signals, I look at the clock and I say, okay, if the ship's heading is facing towards 12 o'clock and I see one o'clock to the right of that, one whistle means I am altering course to starboard. And that's exactly what one, one whistle means in international waters. I am altering course to starboard. Okay. So one whistle, to the right of 12. Now, two whistles, right? Too short. I am altering course to port. So I'm going towards the 11 o'clock, which is two ones. Now these are short blasts. If you remember back over here, one second is the small one. And this really long one is prolonged blast, which is four to, sec four to six seconds. So that's how I annotated it up here with these little um, blocks. So if I am going to alter my course to starboard, in international waters, I'm going to sound one short blast. I am altering course to starboard. Two short, I am altering course to port. Three short, I am operating in a stern propulsion. Now that one I didn't write kind of in a different color because for international and inland, it means exactly the same. So if you hear three short, that means the vessel is backing down. All right. The main thing you need to pick up though, is that for international waters, a power drum vessel inside of another is going to sound one short. I am altering course to starboard towards one o'clock. Two short. I am altering course to port towards 11 o'clock, which has two ones. Okay. And three short. I am operating a stern propulsion. So that's an action signal. So that covers letter A with all the little kind of tick numbers there. Now, if you go over to inland, now, listen, this, the whistle signal is the same, but they change the verbiage because in inland waters, it's different. First off, you would only do a maneuvering and warning signal if you are inside of another, another vessel, meeting or crossing within a half a mile, and you're on a power-driven vessel. So we took it a step further. So if you're in the Chesapeake Bay, you're in inland waters, and you see another vessel three miles away and you look on your radar and you realize you're going to pass two miles away from each other or they're going to cross your bow two miles from you. You don't have to do this signal. The only time you've got to do it in inland waters if you're going to meet or cross within a half mile of each other. Okay, so once you've got that established that you've got a fairly close uh, CPA, you're going to sound either one short, two short, or three short. Now, for inland waters, it is not an action signal. You have to get kind of an agreement from the other vessel. So yes, the, the maneuver on your vessel is the same with the clock. So for one short, yes, you are going to alter to starboard. However, the signal means something different on in the waters. What it says is, I intend to leave you 
on my port side. So yes, you're going to alter course to starboard, but you're going to leave them on your port side, which is why you hear over the radio, we'll meet on one whistle, which is a port to port passage. And yes, you can do this on VHF radio in inland only, and I'll get to that rule a little bit later. However, remember for inland waters, you're in sight, meeting or crossing within a half mile, and we are on a power driven vessel. Okay, so one short, I am going to go that way, but I'm talking about what's going to end up happening. I intend to leave you on my port side. The other, too short, I intend to leave you on my starboard side. Three short, the same, I am operating a stern propulsion. So three short, international or inland, you're backing down. It's just kind of a fancier word for saying that, operating a stern propulsion. Now, for inland, because when we say I intend, I'm saying to you, okay, this is what I would like to do. What do you think? So the other vessel will look and say, okay, it looks safe to me, uh, and then send you back a signal. If they agree in inland waters, they're going to send the same signal back to you. So if you sent one whistle, they're going to respond with one whistle, and these are short whistles, okay? So if they agree, same signal. If they don't agree, that's when we're going to get into the doubt signal, which will be on the next page of this book. Okay. So the main things you've really got to get down uh, with these two rules is when you do it. And then realizing that for international, it is action. I am, I am, don't need a response. For inland, I intend, I intend have to have a response. Whether they agree or don't agree, there needs to be a response. If you send a signal and they send you a mixed signal back, like uh, you send one and they send two, you got to start over because there's some miscommunication there. Okay, and It's always good to call up the vessel and kind of establish communications. Now, uh, if you look at letter B, I'm back on the international side just to kind of keep going down. It says any vessel may, now this is not a requirement, any vessel may supplement the whistle signals prescribed in paragraph A of this rule with light signals. Now, supplement means in addition, right? So you would not forego the whistle signals and do light signals. This would be in addition. So you may have some blinkers up on your, uh, the ends of your mast, and you could send a signal, kind of like Morse code, uh, to flash these patterns the same way you would with the whistle signal. The main thing you need to know for the Coast Guard exam is um, on letter B I I I. It says the light used for this signal, if shall if fitted, be an all round white light. Now there's a bunch more details uh, that go with that as far as um, the distance and all that stuff, but not real important for a Coast Guard exam. But it is an all round white light, okay? And it's going to have the same flash patterns as what you see up here. So that is a supplemental light, and it is white. Now for inland, you know, uh, kind of when we wrote these inland rules, uh, we always kind of have to be different. So if you look under B I I I for the inland side, you'll notice it's a little bit different. And it says the light used for this signal shall, if fitted, be one all round white or yellow light. So you'll see here, I have white or yellow. So international supplemental light, white, inland, white or yellow. All right, so a little bit of differences when we talk about this maneuvering and warning section. So make sure you spend a lot of time understanding action, intention, answer, no answer. Okay, it's just, it's just how it is. They're doing it. Okay, so on that part, we were mostly talking about meeting and crossing. Now, the bottom part of the book gets into overtaking. So a little bit of difference there. So what I want to remind you, uh, up here, we had the same signal for both sides, but different language. The bottom, they did the exact opposite. They changed the signal for each, but kept the same verbiage. So it, it can be a little tricky. But the rule still kind of applies that clock thing, if you are thinking about the clock, okay? Um, so on the international side, and I will step out of the way here, on the international side, so we're down here in the overtaking section. 
On the international side, it says we're going to do this when they're in a narrow channel or fairway. So this would not be an open water. This would be in a narrow channel, and that's defined by your vessel. What do you think a narrow channel is? Or a fairway that's carved out for safety of navigation. It states that a vessel intending to overtake another shall comply with Rule 9E, and that was uh, the narrow channel rule, and also talked about vessels less than 20 meters, sailing vessels and fishing vessels. So remember those rules. It says a, um, a vessel should indicate her intention with the following signals on her whistle. Two prolonged followed by one short means I intend to overtake you on your starboard side. Now, the two prolong here doesn't, in, doesn't signal a uh, maneuver to port or starboard. It's an attention getter. It's saying, hey, I'm getting ready to send you a signal. Listen up. So if I'm hearing, bah, 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 those two prolong at the very beginning are getting your attention to listen up. All right. And the one short goes back to the same up here. The one short, thinking about the clock going towards one o'clock, right? They're going to starboard. And so the uh, verbiage is, I intend to overtake you on your starboard side. Now for overtaking, it's an intention on both international and inland, because when you're going to overtake someone, you don't always see what's up in front of that vessel. So you always kind of have to ask permission to overtake someone. So the two prolong is the intention getter. The one short is that you're going to starboard. And then two prolong, two short, we're going to the two ones of the, of the clock. Uh, I intend to overtake you on your port side. Now, if in international waters, the other vessel agrees with you, they're going to sound Morse code Charlie. Morse code Charlie is prolong short, prolong short. And that means I concur or I agree, right? We use that as, as agreement signal, but I always remember Charlie in this case means I concur. So it helps me remember that a little bit. So two prolong one short, I intend to overtake you on your starboard side. Two prolong two short, I intend to overtake you on your port side. And then prolong short, prolong short is Morse code Charlie. Now for inland, the verbiage is the exact same as what I just said, except for there is no attention getter. No attention getter. So one short, I'm going towards that one o'clock, right? Two short, I'm going towards the 11 o'clock. So one short, I intend to overtake you on your starboard side. Too short, I intend to overtake you on your port side. And so it's very important that you understand the differences in the signal and the differences in the verbiage. For inland, instead of Morse code Charlie, we don't do that. We sound the same signal. So that's consistent at maneuvering for a crossing and meeting and also for um, an overtaking situation. It's consistently going to be the same signal if you agree. Okay. So I will uh, continue on in this rule and turning the page to 101, and I'm going to be on the inland side this time, mostly because it has a little extra information. Letter D when vessels in sight of one another are approaching each other and from any cause either fails to understand the intentions or actions of the other or is in doubt whether sufficient action is being taken by the other to avoid collision, the vessel in doubt shall immediately indicate such doubt by giving at least five short and rapid blasts. Such signal may be supplemented by a light signal of at least five short and rapid blasts. So the reason they changed that, I envision, is because when it was called the danger signal, someone may not use it because they're not necessarily in danger. Um, but it should be used anytime you're in doubt as to the intentions of the other vessel. Like, I'm not quite sure what you're doing, and I cannot reach you on the radio, so I'm going to sound five short so we can kind of work this out. Now, letter E, I mentioned it in the first uh, lesson when we talked about narrow channels. And I mentioned that when you're uh, coming around a blind bend, 
uh, you would sound the signals to say, hey, I'm here. And then you would say, hey, I'm here. I hear you. And so this is where you, they tell you what that whistle signal is. And it's letter E. It says a vessel nearing a bend or in an area of a channel or fairway where other vessels may be obscured by an intervening obstruction shall sound one prolonged blast. This signal shall be answered with a prolonged blast by any approaching vessel that may be within hearing around the bend or behind an intervening obstruction. So I've, I've uh, probably had this happen in the past, but most recently I saw this happen when I was down in Charleston and doing some training for a company there. And this particular company had smaller vessels tied up on one side of the pier. And on the other side of the pier are these large pre-positioning ships that are um, um, maintained by MARAD. And so these big ships block the whole other side of the pier. Well, when that towing vessel is you know, around and going outbound, there is traffic that's coming from the side of that pre-positioning ship. And so before the tug kind of pokes its head out, it's going to give one prolong to say, hey, I'm here coming around this bend and you may not see me and I don't see you right now. So we're going to communicate to each other that, hey, here I am coming out from this pier and you may not see me around the back of that ship. And if you are there, go ahead and give me a one prolong just to let me know that you heard me and that you're also in a position around that blinded area. So it does happen. It's fairly frequent. And remember, the purpose of the rules is to avoid collisions. It's not for safe navigation or to tell you, you know, when there's shoal water or anything like that. This deals with collision regulations. We're trying to keep people from hitting each other. And so communication is really the only way to do that. And we do it through voice, through uh, lights. We do it through sound signals. And this is just another way to do that, to just communicate with other vessels that we're here. Now, letter G, if you jump down to letter G, um, now this is the inland side only, and you will see some test questions. It says, when a power-driven vessel is leaving a dock or berth, she shall sound one prolonged blast. Now, I know a lot of you may be thinking, well, we've never done that, and I work for X company. Well, for international waters, you're not required to do that. So there is a test question that's something like it's international only. You're getting away from and away from a docker berth. What sound signal should you sound? And that would be no signal. Now for inland, you are required to do uh, one prolonged blast. So you, you may not be doing that now. And I always tell students that um, when you're in situations like that, you're kind of okay without doing it until you have a collision. And that's the first thing the Coast Guard investigator is going to do is ask around that particular area, did they hear any kind of sounds or whistle signals coming from the vessel um, prior to this collision? And then they're going to say no. And then they're going to say, well, did you sound one prolong when you got underway? And you're going to have to answer no. And that's when they're going to start looking at uh, suspending your license and things like that. So make sure that you're doing these things, especially if they say shall, you've got to do it. Okay. Now letter H, a vessel that reaches agreement with another vessel in a head on crossing or overtaking situation, for example, by using the radio telephone prescribed in the vessel bridge to bridge radio telephone act is not obliged to sound the whistle signal prescribed by this rule, but may do so. So they are saying for inland only, you are authorized to sound, uh, to make these passing arrangements on the radio. And then if you want, um, you still can do the sound signals afterwards. But typically what you'll find in inland waters is two captains will call each other and they will discuss a port to port passage generally, sometimes uh, starboard to starboard, but generally they'll say, I'll meet you on one whistle. They'll roger that, log into the logbook, and then continue on their way. So that is uh, the, the summary of Rule 34. Continuing on with Rule 35, if you turn to page 102 and 103, this section is going to cover sound signals and restricted visibility. And the first page is going to cover basically your under, underway signals. And then the next page is going to cover your signals for anchored and aground. So at the top of 102, it says in or near an area of restricted visibility. And basically what that means is that you don't necessarily have to be in the fog to sound these. If you're anywhere operating near the fog bank or somewhere where 
visibility is restricted, you should also sound these signals. Uh, letter A says, a power-driven vessel making way through the water shall sound at intervals of not more than two minutes, one prolonged blast. A power-driven vessel underway but not making way shall sound uh, two prolonged blasts at two-minute intervals, approximately two minutes. You don't have to be exactly at two, but somewhere right around there. So those are the two main signals that a power-driven vessel would sound. So if you look up here at the board, Two minutes are, you know, not more than two minutes, right around there are your underway signals. So a power-driven vessel, just normal underway, cruising through the water, every two minutes is going to sound one prolonged blast. Bah! Wait a minute, sound the same signal again. Now let's say you're underway on this power-driven vessel and you stop, whatever your reasons, and you're now drifting you're going to sound two prolonged blasts because that means that you're on a power driven vessel and you are underway, but you're not making way. So we're just drifting. Now remember, you're not broke down. There is a question that talks about what would you do immediately upon losing propulsion? Well, at that point, you are a vessel that's not under command and this does not apply to you because a power driven vessel and a vessel that's not under command are two different vessels. So just a normal power driven vessel underway, not making way, two prolonged. So these two are the most common signals, one prolonged or two prolonged, and it only applies to power driven vessels. Any of the other vessels that we defined in rule three would fall under the next signal. One prolonged, two short. One prolonged, two short is all others. And I like to think of those vessels as the hindered vessels. Those are the vessels that have something different going on, like Sailing, fishing, not under command, ram, CBD, and even towing vessels. Let me make sure I write that up there for you. Towing, okay? All of these are listed in your book under um, letter C of Rule 35. It says a vessel not under command, a vessel restricted in ability to maneuver, a vessel constrained by draft, a sailing vessel, fishing, and a vessel engaged in towing or pushing shall, instead of A or B, would sound uh, three blasts in succession, namely one prolonged, two short. So while we'll hear one prolonged, two short, we won't actually know what kind of vessel it is, just being in the fog. We'll just know that it's some vessel that needs special attention. Maybe I need to stay away from that vessel because it's servicing aids to navigation, or it is dredging, or it is sailing, or it's towing. I don't know exactly what it's doing, but I know that it's one of these other category vessels and I need to kind of give them some extra space. Now, there is a little caveat here on letter D, and this is a question that a lot of people miss on the test. So I've outlined it in red here, put some asterisks around it because it's a commonly missed question. It says a vessel engaged in fishing when at anchor and a vessel restricted in ability to maneuver when at anchor shall instead of the uh, signals prescribed in paragraph G, sound the signals prescribed in paragraph C. So she is not going to sound these anchor signals that we're going to talk about in a minute. A restricted vessel and a vessel that is fishing are both going to sound one prolonged, two short, whether she is underway or at anchor. And the general understanding that I have is that if a vessel is fishing, she may have a limited crew member. Uh, count and a vessel that is restricted in ability to maneuver is doing some kind of work and every crew member needs to be doing that work. So instead of taking someone away from work and making them go ring a manual bell because that's the anchor signal, um, we will let that vessel continue to do the automated whistle signal of one prolonged two short. Most vessels will have an automated box that will time this out and keep sending that signal uh, until it stops. So it allows that vessel to keep doing the automated signal instead of having to take a body from the work and putting them out near the forecastle to ring a bell every minute. So that kind of makes sense. But listen, this is a test question that many, many people miss. And it will say something, choose the following uh, answer that corresponds with the vessel that sounds the same signal underway or at anchor. And that would be ram and fishing. So make sure you take special note of that.
Now, ves uh, letter E says a vessel towed, or if more than one vessel is towed, the last vessel of the tow, if manned, shall sound at intervals of not more than two minutes, four blasts in succession, namely one prolonged followed by three short. And this is going to be made immediately after the towing vessel. So what I've drawn up here is the towing vessel that's in a restricted visibility situation. She's going to sound one prolonged too short because that's part of the hindered vessels. Okay. And then I've got a barge and I've got my crew member here on the barge and that will sound one prolonged three short after the tug. And basically what you're doing is you're letting other vessels that might be out there in the fog know that there is a tow. And so it said that if it's the last vessel and it has to be manned. So if you have three barges behind you and they are all unmanned, you would not sound anything. If you have three barges and only the, the front one is manned, you don't sound anything. Because what, what you're indicating with the one prolonged three short is that the, you are the end of a tow. So you wouldn't want to say that from the front barge and then someone come behind that front barge and then go over your tow wire. So the one prolonged three short is if you are on a, uh, a barge or, or something that's being towed and it's the last one and it's manned, you would sound that signal to let others know that you are there. Now turning the page uh, to page 104, and then we'll glance at 105 for a minute. It says, a vessel at anchor shall at intervals of not more than one minute ring the bell rapidly for five seconds. Now that sounds different than this, because remember the underway signals were two minutes. That's because you have more of a chance to maneuver to get out of the way. So let's look at this anchored section. Now these uh, right here, as you see a little closer, are my bells, okay? So that is going to be a bell, and this is going to indicate a gong, all right? Just so you can see that a little closer. So if a vessel is at anchor at approximately one minute intervals, if the vessel is less than 100 meters, she is going to rapidly ring the bell for five seconds, and that's going to happen over and over while you're in a restricted visibility uh, situation. So when we are listening out there, we're going to hear a minute goes by, we're going to hear that. Now, the bell is going to be located in the forward portion of the vessel, typically on a bulkhead in the forward portion, like on the forecastle, And that is because that's typically where we anchor from. So if I hear the bell off in this direction, I want to go the other way because that's going to be where the stern is. Now, if I have a vessel that is 100 meters or greater, I'm going to still ring the bell in the forward section. But if you remember correctly, back when we talked about what type of whistle, uh, excuse me, sound signaling uh, devices a vessel would have, any vessel that was uh, uh, 100 meters and greater was required to have a gong. And that's where this comes into play. So she will ring the bell forward and then she will ring the gong. So five seconds here, five seconds here, still every minute. So this is less than 100 meters, ringing the bell every uh, minute for five seconds. 100 meters or greater, ringing the bell forward, and then ringing the gong aft. And the gong has a different tone. It's more like a pan, like, like gong, gong, whereas the bell is a very distinct sound uh, that sounds like a bell. So that covers the first couple sentences in letter G. The last sentence in letter G states, a vessel may, in addition to uh, sounding excuse me, a vessel at anchor may in addition sound three blasts in succession, namely one short, one prolonged, one short to give warning of her position and the possibility of collision to an approaching vessel. So we have short, prolonged, short, and that is a supplement. Remember that's in addition to you are giving warning of your position. So let's say you've been ringing the bell every minute to let another vessel know that, hey, it's foggy and I'm at anchor. Please don't hit me. But you still see this vessel coming towards your direction and the bell's just not cutting it. Maybe it's just not loud enough and that vessel keeps coming. You can't reach them on radio. 
Well, the whistle can be heard for a couple miles, so you might blast them, right? So short, prolonged short is going to get their attention, hopefully, and let them know where you are so that they alter course to get away from your position. Now, if you look at letter H, uh, it says a vessel aground shall give the bell signal and if required, the gong signal. But in addition, three separate and distinct, distinct strokes of the bell immediately before and after ringing the bell. So the, a ground signal is also done at one minute. So it's consistent. Anchored and a ground is one minute. And we're going to have three distinct strokes before the five second bell and three after. So it's going to be ding, 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 ding. And that's a vessel that's less than 100 meters that is run aground. Now, if you are on a vessel of 100 meters or greater, you're going to do the same thing, but you're going to add the gong just to indicate your length. So still three strokes, followed by rapid ringing of the bell, followed by three strokes, followed by the gong. Remember, the gong just means that you're big. So we're going to put that at the stern area to let them know that, hey, if you're going around me, you're trying to get away from that bell signal because that's where the anchor chain is. I'm going to let you know that I'm still really big back here. So you'll hear the gong as you're trying to go around. So the main things that you want to remember here is the bell is for the smaller vessels. The bell and gong is for 100 meters and greater. And if you are aground, if you see a test question that says you hear three distinct strokes of the bell, you automatically know that vessel is aground. So now you're just listening, is there a gong? So then I would know it's 100 meters or greater aground. So bells and gongs are always going to be related to uh, anchored and aground. And then they're always going to be at one minute intervals because you're more uh, susceptible to an, a collision because you're not able to move quickly. So we want to sound that pretty often. You'd be pretty surprised at how long two minutes goes by if you were doing them at two minute intervals in the fog. That's just way too long. All right. Now, uh, on letter I, it says a vessel of 12 meters or more, but less than 20 meters shall not be obliged to give the bell signal that we just talked about, but if not, some other efficient sound. And then also for a vessel of less than 12 meters, some other efficient sound. So that might be that air horn that we talked about before. You're just kind of indicating your position. Now, letter K states a pilot vessel when engaged in pilot duties may, in addition to the signals prescribed above, sound an identity signal of four short. So how I remember that right over here, I am your pilot, okay? Four short, I am your pilot. Now that doesn't give them any kind of special treatment. It's just that if they're sounding one prolonged, underway, making way, heading out to your vessel, we want to indicate ourselves to be different than other vessels and that we're a pilot if you're looking for us to, to help you come into port we want to make sure you know who we are so we say one prolong I mean, excuse me one prolong would be uh, you know you're making way and then you'd have four short after that to state that you're a pilot now look over on page 105 105 says the following vessel shall not be required, 105 L, excuse me, the following vessel shall not be required to sound signals as prescribed in paragraph G when anchored in a special anchorage area designated by the Coast Guard. A vessel of less than 20 meters, a barge, canal boat, scow, or other nondescript craft. Generally, their, their thinking is that we know it's an anchorage area. So if vessels are in there, they're probably anchored, but this only applies to vessels of less than 20 meters and some of those other uh, kind of odd vessels. But when you see a test question, you're looking for the length, all right? So if it says it's 65 meters in a special anchorage area, she would still have to sound that signal. Now let's look at rule uh, 36. Um, now 36, um, just says signals to attract attention. If necessary to attract attention of another vessel, any vessel may make light or sound signals that cannot be mistaken for any signal authorized by the rules or may direct the beam of a searchlight in the direction of danger in a way uh, as to not embarrass another vessel. So that's always an option to use your searchlight. 
Now, uh, rule 37 is your distress signals. So if you look at your book, you'll see a whole bunch of pictures here. So you definitely want to get to know those. That would be a fairly easy question on the test if you're familiar. So distress would be red star shells continuously sounding your fog signal. So putting it on and leaving it on. Flames on a vessel may be in a burning barrel to billow up smoke to attract attention. Gunfire at one minute intervals. A orange background uh, with a black ball and square. SOS, which is dit, 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 da, 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 dit, dit, dit. Mayday by radio, uh, which means uh, help me in French. Parachute red flare, a die marker. The code flags November and Charlie. So if you're traveling international, uh, typically ships will have a flag bag of A through Z of flags. So they would throw up November and Charlie up on the yard arm. A square flag with a ball, which I've seen that on the test as well. Waving your arms up and down is obviously a distress signal. An Inmarsat in call, digital selective calling. Uh, EPIRB, which is a position indicating radio beacon for emergencies. And then orange smoke. All of those are considered distress signals. The one that is not a distress signal that you see on the test quite a bit um, is the doubt signal or the danger signal because they probably haven't rewritten that question to update the language. However, if danger or doubt is a choice, that is not a distress signal. That means that you're in doubt of the other vessel's intentions. So don't fall for that one, right? The, the danger or doubt signal is not a distress signal. That means that your vessel is in danger or you have some uh, emergency going on. Now, the United States added on the inland side, which uh, could be a little tricky if you saw this on the test, it says that she can show a high-intensity white light flashing at 50 to 70 times per minute. So we added another light on the inland side. So you should be familiar with that as well. Now, when we get into the back of the book, that's the annexes. Annex 1 is the technical details of lights and shapes, basically how they have to be mounted and how far do we have to see them and so on. Annex 2 is the fishing vessels. And in the front, I covered that for the inland side, but they list them again for the international side back here. And then we have sound signaling in Annex 3. Really no test questions from any of this. Annex 4 is the textual description of those distress signals that I just talked about. So I showed you the pictograms, but that is the textual uh, description of that. And then Annex 5 is the piloting rules, and that's where you're going to find uh, vessel traffic service. You're going to find the call regs demarcation line, which is very important. But most important for the test, you're going to look at page 137. And on 137, there's two types of lights that we always see on exams. The first one is very easy, law enforcement. Okay, Law enforcement vessels may display a flashing blue light when engaged in direct law enforcement or public safety activity. So that's easy. Most police officers that you see pulled over on the side of the road are going to be flashing a blue light. Now, the other one is 88.07, which is public safety activities. And it says vessels engaged in government sanctioned public safety activities and commercial vessels performing similar functions may display an alternately flashing red and yellow light signal. This identification light must be located so it doesn't interfere with the vessel's navigation and is an identification signal and conveys no special privilege. So an alternately flashing red and yellow is for public safety. And you might see this at a nautical parade. For example, here uh, in Norfolk, we have a tall ship um, celebration at the beginning of June. So you'll see a lot of ships coming in from all around the world. And we'll have some public safety out there that helps kind of corral all of the recreational boaters to kind of keep them out of the way and keep things safe. So you'll see the red and yellow flashing at times during um, some of those nautical parades and so on. So that is a summary of section four of the rules of the road. And if you are unsure of anything, feel free to go back and look at the other three sections or this one. Pause, take notes. The main thing that you need to do is study, right? You do have to do some memorization for these rules. And then once you really understand the rules, these questions will not 
uh, get you, so to speak. A lot of students say there's trick questions, but it really just comes down to do you know the rules in detail, okay? So good luck in your test prep, and we'll see you in the next video.